Hello, this is Representative Pam Powers Hanley. Welcome to my podcast, A View from the Left Side. For many years in the Arizona House, my seat was on the far left side of the chamber. As a progressive Democrat and one of the most independent representatives in the House, I always believed that that was a fitting seat for me. This podcast features in-depth interviews with newsmakers from all walks of life, as well as political and social commentary. Thanks for joining me on the left side today. Before each legislative session, out-of-town legislators like me have to find living quarters in Phoenix for roughly six months. Shopping for apartments and combing through corporate websites to look for affordable housing with no hidden fees is a laborious process. No matter how careful I am, the corporate landlords seem to always stick me with something that I don't want. A few years ago, I made the mistake of renting a smart apartment. I saw on the website that the smart apartment option was available. I didn't realize until I showed up with movers and a truck full of my furniture that I couldn't get out of that option. A smart apartment is one that tracks your every entry and exit with your smartphone. It tracks your utility usage and it tracks who knows what else. My smart apartment had sensors hung all over the place, including the closets and the cupboards. I don't know what they were tracking in the cupboards. Anyway, the sensors were pretty easy to see and a little bit creepy. What wasn't so easy to see was the clause in my lease that said by signing the lease, I was giving permission to an unnamed subcontractor to collect, store, and use my data in perpetuity, including selling it. I couldn't get out of the $40 a month smart apartment fee, but I chose not to download the app. The smart apartment now seems like kind of a quaint way to do surveillance on apartment dwellers because the tracking was so obvious. By accepting a little bit of inconvenience and not downloading the app, I was able to get around most of the surveillance. Today, with social media plus 5G smartphones, smart watches, and all sorts of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth-enabled devices from refrigerators to car radios, we are surrounded by devices and software programs that are tracking us, collecting data, building profiles, and using what they have learned about us to influence our behavior. Maybe the data-driven algorithms are just trying to get you to buy another pair of shoes because you posted a picture of your old shoes on Instagram. Or maybe they're feeding you misinformation to keep you outraged and engaged in order to boost their profits and their statistics. Recently, Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen told Congress that when there are, quote, conflicts between its profits and our safety, Facebook consistently resolved these conflicts in favor of its own profit. The result has been more division, more harm, more lies, more threats, and more combat, end quote. According to Haugen and others, Facebook knows that its algorithms boost engagement with the site by boosting outrage, fear, and other negative emotions. An overabundance of fake news, paid political advertising, and trolls gaslighting the facts have turned most social media sites into cesspools of misinformation and clickbait to boost engagement and profits. There is little or no regulation to protect the privacy of the unassuming public or to ensure the accuracy of information disseminated through social media. Consumers are left to ferret out scams and misinformation on their own. The highly unregulated landscape of internet-based commerce and finance is the ideal breeding ground for risky financial schemes. Enter cryptocurrency, non-fungible tokens, and blockchain. Maybe you have heard these terms, but you really don't know what they mean or you don't understand them. My guest today will talk about internet privacy, cybersecurity, and their relationship to cryptocurrency, NFTs, and blockchain. One reason why you should care about these terms and maybe learn a little bit more about them is that the Arizona legislature created a blockchain and cryptocurrency study committee 
to promote these new technologies, not really to study them. The committee, which is currently meeting during the interim, publicly and on video, has 19 members. There are four Republicans, two Democrats, and the rest of the committee is made up of people who will benefit from this legislation because they are in the industry of cryptocurrency or blockchain. What could go wrong? My guests today are two of my colleagues in the House of Representatives, Representative Domingo de Grazia from LD10 in Tucson and Representative Mitzi Epstein from up in Maricopa County. We have a wide ranging collection of topics for today's podcast. And first, we're going to start with Representative de Grazia because he has a particular interest in data privacy and the internet and has a lot of knowledge and background. So I'm going to turn the floor over to him first. Domingo, I'm like really concerned about data privacy and corporations snooping on my private life and tracking me wherever I go? And am I a nervous Nelly or do I have reason to be a little bit cautious? You have every reason to be cautious. The The landscape of the way that information about us is collected has changed in the last, say, 20, 30 years. And th- there's kind of a shift in mentality that uh, amongst corporations that they believe they have the right to uh, collect as much information about you as possible. And oftentimes with the goal of influencing the way that you do something or influencing your decisions. You know, in the old days, we would listen to uh, FM radio, either driving in your car or at home, you would listen to FM radio. And that was a one-way broadcast. You could you could listen to it, pick up the transmission. And if you didn't want to give them any information, you wouldn't proactively send any information to them. But now when you listen to say Pandora or you watch Netflix or you do anything that involves the internet, there's a a two-way information exchange going. Not only what you're watching, who you are, what information is on your phone oftentimes can be accessed, um, when you're watching for how long. All of this gets taken by the, the corporations to build a profile on you. And there are data aggregators that oftentimes are not publicly known entities that aggregate data on you, everything from the publicly available information about the house that you bought from the tax assessors to what routers that your phone is paying off of when you go to, say, a shopping mall. Because this information is incredibly valuable to those that are trying to figure out what we're going to do next and figure out what uh, ways we can be best influenced. When you're looking at apps on your phone, if you cannot tell what the product is for an app, then you are the product. And every day that you're generating data, you are giving them more information um, to know about you. And some folks are completely unconcerned about this. The question that I always have, the, the real bottom line question is, I should be told before the information is collected, be told that it's going to be collected, and I should have the option to opt out of it. I should have the ability to say, no, I don't want you to collect this information about me. Or, you know, in the alternative, I'm not going to use this app because that's the way it's built. So the question is, what does privacy mean in Arizona? What does it mean that privacy, the word privacy is in our constitution? Should we have the ability to know what information is collected, to opt out, to have it deleted, to have it corrected? There's a whole myriad of things that we can do that really folks should start paying attention to because all of our lives are being captured in digital form and they will exist from now until forever, whether you want it to or not. Oh, privacy is just something that we sort of don't have anymore, but we should. You know, as, as Representative De Grazia pointed out, consumers should know their data is being gleaned and they should have the option to opt out, but we don't. And so we have to approach every app that we open with that attitude. And I think it's kind of sad that so many of us have just sort of th- thrown our hands up at the wind and said, I can't deal with it. I guess everybody will just own all my data. But but it's our job as people who look out and put consumer protections in place into the system to make the economy work, it's our job to find a way to to find a happier medium. Yeah, it's really concerning to me. I have family members who think that I'm just being silly about this and there's not a problem. As far as I'm concerned, they trust the tech giants way too much. The targeting is really fascinating. Jim and I will watch YouTube together. And of course, YouTube wants us to each have a separate profile because I'm the cheapskate who hasn't paid for YouTube. And so I get the commercials and he doesn't. But the targeting, I look at what is fed to him from YouTube and I'm like, honey, what are you watching? 
I don't like all the targeting. And I swear, I mean, maybe Representative DeGrazia can allay my fears on this, but I think that the devices are listening to us. There are things that I've just mentioned and never put on Facebook and didn't put anywhere else. And all of a sudden the ads pop up. The advertising is just pervasive. And it's just a little bit too much for me because I know my data is behind it. You have a, uh, a substantial reason to be concerned. You know, your, your concern that devices might be listening is not a new concern. And the, the real interesting part is that there are no laws to stop devices from doing that, to stop app makers from doing that. We don't have much control over what private corporations do. And as one American president said probably, I think, 40 years ago now, the business of America is business, which means that the industry gets to regulate itself and the industry does what's good for the industry. Meaning that if the data industry needs to have consumer information, they're going to make their own rules such that they can still get consumer information. The real down the rabbit hole concern that you have is we've seen in the last hundred years where the aggregation of data goes really, really horribly wrong. And I'm talking about uh, World Wars One and Two. Imagine the personal information, the, the private information of folks about their religion, about their race, about their nationality, their origin, their sexual orientation, um, and I think I said religious beliefs, how those were used by European countries to round people up and have them murdered. That is the, the foundation of a lot of the European, the EU data privacy regulations called GDPR, the General Data Privacy Regulations, to stop that from happening because those folks live through it. They know exactly what happens when people start getting too much information about you. And what we see happening in the U.S. in terms of decisions being influenced is that algorithms from advertising companies, when I say algorithms, they're computer programs from advertising companies, Twitter, Facebook, Google, all of these others, the computer programs are written in such a way that they exploit the fear and anger that humans naturally have in order to drive people to continue looking at their site. It's not a secret. This is what they use, and it's an incredibly effective tool. We have no way to put the brakes on. Those algorithms that capture our data, what we looked at, what we didn't, and suggest things, they are there to help folks see a material that makes them either afraid or angry so that they will stay engaged on that platform. And it's a, it's a huge concern. It has some serious, serious effects, especially for kids, which we're just now kind of getting the, some daylight into what kind of negative effect that has. You know, we can see the, there are some fairly innocuous, benign results. For instance, I once watched a video on YouTube about a tiger. And of course, next thing I know, they're feeding me every video you can imagine about people who have bizarre pets. And I just felt like, give me a button to turn this off. How do I make it stop? And, you know, that's kind of innocuous. But where it's not innocuous is radicalization. And the kind of targeting that is being done where people take a look at one thing, they take in one kind of information, and then the algorithm feeds them that information again and again and again and again, making propaganda really easy to spread, but also disinformation and outright lies get spread so easily because of these algorithms that are intended to be advertising. Let's assume that large corporations like Facebook and Google and so on have chosen to do this simply because they are really good at marketing. But the other consequences, they're now really good at spreading lies and spreading propaganda. And to some extent, are they brainwashing people? Just recently, the Boston Marathon bombing had an anniversary. And back then, we knew that the bombers at the Boston Marathon were being radicalized from YouTube videos. So we have known this for a very long time, that people are being radicalized and that there is misinformation that's being spread. And it's only come to light more with the recent whistleblower from Facebook and other things. There's been documentaries on Facebook on Frontline and the talk about the anger and the outrage algorithms and things like good luck trying to set your news feed to most recent so you can see what your friend from high school said, because it's always set to most popular, which means it's the one that's feeding the outrage. 
And sometimes you'll click on the link and it has nothing to do with whatever the headline was. It's that whole clickbait idea. And so I think it's just really dangerous. And again, as you said, what's coming out with targeting towards younger and younger and younger kids, uh, the way they've changed Instagram, we really need regulation on this. Uh, one thing I've talked to you about in the past, Representative de Grazia, is some of the regulations that are in Europe on the internet. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Do you think that they go far enough or what do you think we should do in the United States? European Union has put together the GDPR, which is their kind of privacy regulation. And it covers everything from employment privacy all the way through religious choices. And then, of course, it goes on to what happens at the Internet. The European Union and European countries are kind of struggling with what's sufficient and what goes too far. But they've done something. They've taken a step. And a lot of times when you go to a European website, say you go to BBC, there might be some questions on there about where you are, what kind of information you're opting into to share with them. And in some of that is coming to the U.S. already, and it's come through California. California has the CCPA, which passed, I believe, 2018. It's the California Consumer Privacy Act, and now the CPRA, which is regulations. And I, I read that the California Attorney General is now promulgating rules, and they're getting their actual office set up to pursue these, because most American states don't have any type of privacy regulation. We have consumer protections that come through the, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, Usually it's section five is consumer protections. And we have some here in Arizona through the laws that prevent consumer fraud, which can be broad, it can be kind of narrow, but the attorney general doesn't often act on those, especially when it comes to data privacy. So we've got a really, really small amount of privacy protection coming along, but as it spreads through the U.S., it's it's coming slowly and a very much a patchwork quilt. And the U.S. Congress seems to have the inability to get out of its own way and make some kind of decision. They've been posting bills for probably five years years now, it's, it's got to be at least maybe two dozen. And I don't think they've really gotten anything meaningful through. So it, it's in the works. We'll have to see what the appetite amongst American companies will be because consumers are generally ambivalent and companies don't want it at all. So we're in a bit of a, a gridlock here. There's a lot of people who, as Representative Epstein said earlier, just have given up on trying to protect their data. And there are others who don't think it's a big deal. I mean, I almost think there's a generational thing also. I've talked to family members who are millennials and they're like, what are you concerned about, mom? And I was like, they're tracking me. I used to wear an Apple watch. And when I was canvassing once, I came back to my house and between my Apple watch and my phone, which was also connected to the voter database, the van, there was my entire route. They're like, oh, look, there's your whole route. Isn't that cool? I say, no, that's not cool. I don't want that out there. I don't want everybody to know every step I made during the day. Too much information. Information. If they want to know the stores I went to and the people I visited, they can ask me or buy that data from me. I just don't think that they should just take it. Well, and, and you have a legitimate concern there. Remember Fitbit, it came out in the news that a, a nation state actor, I believe it was China, was able to access Fitbit information that a lot of American uh, servicemen and women were wearing. And the, the problem was that they were wearing those watches, those devices inside buildings that were classified. So because of that device tracking, because of the, the geo mapping that happened on those devices, nation state actors were getting detailed information about where the rooms were, how what the layout was, just from siphoning off that data from the top of the device. Same thing was happening with a drone manufacturer, DJI. All of the, the information, the video that's captured goes back to their main hub in uh, in China. So for any time an American who legitimately buys a DJI when they were flying near bridges, power plants, anything that had a strategic national security interest, those images were going back to another nation state actor. So there are a lot of ways that this can get really, really complicated, really fast. And we have some information collecting that happens post 9-11 happened in the U.S. And, and we saw whistleblowers that, um, that shed light on that about the American government siphoning our own data and collecting it on us. I have an iPhone, which is getting old, right? And then it starts to get constipated and it's not running right. And I went to one of those websites that tells you what you can turn off on your phone. So I started deleting things. I started moving photos off of there. But then I found this website that showed me how to get down into the bowels of the setting of the iPhone and start turning things off previous versions of the iPhone, they've changed it now. Previous versions, all the apps were allowed to track you 100% from the beginning. It probably took me an hour and a half to turn off settings on so many things and delete so many things. 
my phone ran a lot better. The key one was, allow this app to learn from you. And I said, hell no. And so you turn that off, your phone runs better. They're still tracking me, I know that, but it's not quite so much. So I'd like to shift gears just a little bit. We've been talking a lot about privacy and the internet. And there are proponents who want to push our finances and our money more towards the internet. Just recently in the Arizona legislature, they created a blockchain and cryptocurrency study committee to think about additional bills that could be passed in Arizona to promote, it's set up as promoting cryptocurrency and blockchain. And so I see this also as a little bit scary. I think cryptocurrency is very worrisome. I don't know that that's secure. We just talked about the internet not being secure, your data not being secure. Having your money like that seems not good. And then the whole blockchain thing has lots of red flags for me. So Mitzi, do you want to start on blockchain and cryptocurrency? And what do you think about these trends? The problem with this committee that was created, the biggest problem is that it is created with the charter, as you indicated to promote blockchain and cryptocurrency. And if you start a committee to promote something, well, shouldn't you investigate and find out if it's a good thing first? And is there really anything that is only good and therefore should be promoted? So, you know, except for maybe our children whom we love, anything else should be approached carefully and thoughtfully. And this committee just seems to be going in blindly to say, absolutely, blockchain is just the bee's knees. Well, the bees have some cruddy looking knees sometimes. So this committee has a problem. Uh, Blockchain overall is great. It's just another cool technology. We're talking about technology and different kinds of software and different ways to store data. So blockchain is one of them. It's as though if we were talking about restaurants, pickles are an item on your sandwich. It's just one thing. It's not the most grand and glorious thing that's going to save the day. I have a friend in technology who calls it giraffe repellent. In other words, it works quite well most of the time. If you need giraffe repellent, it's a pretty good giraffe repellent. But, you know, do you need it for every Everything. So one of the places where blockchain is particularly useful is supply chains. And I, I'm hopeful for a lot of cool improvements in being able to know, you know, where did this apple come from? You know, what pesticides have gotten onto it? And think of complex machinery in manufacturing companies, knowing where all of their suppliers and where their everything has been previously can be very helpful. When I worked in manufacturing, knowing who's the supplier for this bolt that keeps breaking, I need to know that and I need to back that up. So supply chains really do matter. And and that could be a good use of blockchain. I guess my concern is for finance and is having a distributed ledger. I mean, I, I listened to at least part of the premier meeting for the Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Study Committee, and there was an IBM representative who's been working in blockchain since 2012 or something like that. And I think the New York Times called blockchain the best new idea that never got off the ground. But anyway, this IBM guy was explaining it, and it's like, really convinced me that this is the better way to do our finances. I mean, I don't think we're secure now. I don't know that that's really going to do it. Domingo, what do you think about blockchain and cryptocurrency? The mathematics and the programming behind blockchain is solid. I mean, that's the the whole point of it is that it can be independently verified one link to the next so that you don't have any corruption or deletion or addition of information that shouldn't be there. So that part of it's fine. When we get into things like cryptocurrency, though, one of the questions I have for this committee is which ones of them have investments in crypto? As legislators, we all have to make disclosures at least once a year about what our financial interests are. And it is against the the notion of ethics that the folks that have a financial interest in something would be promoting bills to promote it in the state. So that's one question. But you really have to wonder as far as promoting crypto generally, um, the financial stability of it and how good that is for our society, because essentially it's built on nothing. I mean, it's not built on anything other than it's not a Ponzi scheme, but similar to a Ponzi scheme, the more money that people put into it, the more money that's in it and the more that the the coins are worth. And you see this when uh, Bitcoins or or other uh, crypto coins crash. And they do crash. There is probably a few a week that go down to a zero value or that folks find out that it was a complete fraud from the beginning. You lose value because it's not based on anything. And that that argument can be made for like real estate. We saw that in 2008 when the real estate market jumped up from 2005 to 2008 and then crashed again. So it's really not based on much that's tangible. Crypto and NFTs tend to be particularly susceptible to not having any backing at all and just being plucked from the, the ether essentially. 
Well, there are actually a couple of cryptocurrency entrepreneurs on that committee with the legislature besides the IBM guy is on that committee. So they have the corporations helping them write the laws to promote these new technologies. You mentioned NFTs, the non-fungible tokens. That's another thing I'm really kind of confused about. I see that and sort of cryptocurrency as ways that would open the door for some sort of fraud or scams. Do either of you have a comment on that? Yeah, NFTs are really, really interesting. And as far as I understand, there was someone that purchased an NFT for the first tweet that was sent out on Twitter. It's interesting because that first tweet exists on everybody that had Twitter at that time. It it is not a singular thing that exists in physical form. So someone paid money for this NFT for that, which is baffling. I'd like somebody to buy my yesterday, which is as intangible and as disconnected from anything else. So yeah, NFTs are strange. I know that they're, uh, they're picking up some kind of steam and there are some uses that some artists and musicians are using them. I think that there's two things about cryptocurrency that I hope your listeners can really get their minds around and think about. One is, as Repto Grazia just mentioned, it is intangible. There's no there there. And unlike a song, well, you can't touch a song, but you know the song is a thing. Whereas in cryptocurrencies, it's basically meaningless. And yet it is an asset. It's not a currency. It has been thoroughly proven that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are used as assets. People try to buy them low and sell them high. And it's a nothing that they're buying low and selling high, but it's treated therefore like an asset and it's taxed like an asset. And the idea is that if you buy a certain number of crypto coins at one point and you sell them at another point, the point at which they become dollars, you're supposed to pay taxes on them. So in that way, it's like an asset, but because it's so intangible, what is that? What have you gained? But there's many things. And and as we go forward, there'll be more and more things in the world that are completely intangible that people will trade. So then we have to take a look at the other really important characteristic of cryptocurrencies. And let's take a look at the name, crypto. It's secret. It is intended to have no idea who's behind this. And there are some that are becoming more that you can figure out who various buyers and sellers are on some blockchains. That's a possibility. But for the most part, cryptocurrencies were created to keep everything very anonymous. In fact, they were created by a group that intended to be anonymous, even to the extent that it one point, there was talk of, you know, this could be a way to assassinate people, that you could just put it out there to say, okay, the person who guesses when politician Smith is going to die, that person who guesses it gets all this crypto that everybody else will sort of bet on. And guess what? The person who assassinates politician Smith is the one who wins because they knew exactly when the person would die. And it's all so anonymous and so secret that this was a huge topic and rather frightening because not just politicians, but anybody. Think anybody that is coming out, any of your competitors in your company. If assassinations become the purpose of cryptocurrencies, that's a good reason to regulate them. It's being used for money laundering and things like that too, isn't it? Sure. Google uh, (laughs) cryptocurrency money laundering and you'll get many, many examples of that going on. I think that the more common situation is the sort of Ponzi scheme that gets set up and people get taken in that way. That's the kind of fraud that I've seen happen more often. But certainly money laundering is out there. If you want to sell uh, illegal guns and drugs, the cryptocurrency has become a good way to do it. So correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't that pipeline hack that happened several months ago, that was a hack through cryptocurrency, wasn't it? That's exactly it. Yeah, what you're seeing is the the bad actors and the nation state actors that put malware on our computers, that lock them up, that essentially make cyber attacks on us when they ask for ransom payments for ransomware. Oftentimes it is in cryptocurrency and there are teams in the US that handle high level ransomware attacks and handle the purchasing and payout of these monies to to the bad actors, to the nation state actors, to the extent I believe that President Biden has just put out a mandate that public companies are no longer going to be able to pay with cryptocurrency for those types of violations because it is so pervasive and so hard to catch the bad actors. One of the other things I wanted to point out is that there's a lot of, I guess, disagreement on the international level about cryptocurrency. We have the country of El Salvador shockingly changing their national currency to a cryptocurrency. And then you have China saying, oh, okay, this stuff is too dangerous and we're not going to have it at all. And then we have Arizona going, hey, what can we do to promote this? I think that there's a lot of risk going on. So what do you guys think about what's going on internationally versus Arizona on these types of issues? 
Well, as I said, I think Arizona, the, this committee is foolish if they simply go forward and say we should promote. But I think that one of the reasons that there's so much volatility out there from El Salvador to China is that you know the block, a blockchain as a database, people keep trying to sell it as infallible, that it's absolutely secure. But it's not. And the smaller the blockchain, meaning the, the fewer participants in one particular group that is doing blockchain to do a thing, then the more likely there is to have a hack and that a majority of the participants could collude together and actually cor corrupt the database and, and put uh, inaccurate and wrong information out there. So the idea that blockchain is always perfect and infallible, we know as humans, <laughs> that's never true. And I know as a, a computer systems analyst that in the case of blockchain, it's not true either. So we have to keep that in mind when we're planning what to do in, into the future. When we're looking at what other countries are doing, remember that the banking industry has a huge incentive to keep people banking with traditional money. And when you start cutting out the banking industry folks, which there are a myriad of them along the way, they start losing money. So there are a lot of people that are really interested in not having crypto pick up. But when you have a, a, com a country like El Salvador, where their monetary system is a little bit destabilized anyway, it's pretty easy to overlay a cryptocurrency there and make it just open for use. And you know, when we're talking about other countries as as well, there are estimates that the processing of the computer processors that are being used and invoked to crank through these crypto calculations, they're using a stunning amount of electricity on average, something like small countries use. So we're going to need to get a handle on the environmental impacts of it before we start using it widespread. You know, if folks want to use renewable energies for it, I suppose that's going to be fine. But I know that there was a town in Pennsylvania that was bought by a crypto processor because there was a power plant that they could use to generate their own power. We're just about out of time. So I'm going to give you guys each like a minute, a half or two minutes. Do you have any parting thoughts? Well, one last parting thought on blockchain is that it is also uh, one of the least efficient forms of database. So because there's no central processor, there's copies of it, bazillions of copies of it out there. So if we were to have, you know, have transactions and Pam, you and I have a transaction, I give you a receipt. I would also give Domingo a receipt. Now multiply that times how many number of people are in the part participating and you can quickly see it's a very inefficient way, but it can, it does have its uses. It's just that it isn't great for everything. And I think that's the final comment is that we should not assume too much, but let's take a look at each case and see, is this a case where blockchain is a good idea? Is there a crypto currency style of system that can be made regulated so that it is harder to rip people off and that it's harder to for it to be used for money laundering and so on. Let's take them case by case. And as the state, we really need to take a look at those before we say, let's just develop this technology blindly. On the side of data privacy and cybersecurity, I think that folks should really consider what they think privacy is in the digital realm. And I advocate for folks knowing what information is collected and, and being able to opt out of it before it's collected. There are a lot of great uses for companies to have information about us, but we also see things like Cambridge Analytica, where companies were incredibly um, irresponsible with data and it was used to influence us in a negative way. So just be aware, if you don't know what the product is, you are the product. Well, I really appreciate you both coming on my podcast today and talking about this wide ranging topic. I'm sure we'll have one or more follow ups on this, especially as we go into the session. If we have bills coming up on this topic, I really think it's something that we have to look at and just be skeptical about. And I really appreciate your opinions on privacy, about data collection, about blockchain, about cryptocurrency and international finance. And so thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for tuning in to A View from the Left Side today. If you enjoyed the show, please consider liking this podcast on social media and becoming a subscriber. This is Representative Pam Powers Hanley signing off. Until next time, please take care of yourself, stay healthy, and stay vigilant.